Now, first of all, I just want to say, since John mentioned the tests, here's something encouraging. Um, you can take the tests as often as you want and flunk as often as you want. And it being a government job, you can in fact join the Foreign Service until the age of 59. Okay, so it's never, almost never, too late. Um, and uh, it's interesting to talk to other Foreign Service officers. By the way, um, I now am used to calling myself uh, an ex-diplomat. One of the annoying things about being a Foreign Service officer is like, it sounds, at least to my generation, it sounds like the guys in the French Foreign Legion with the, the things in the back of their hats. It doesn't sound cool at all. Whereas diplomat sounds cool. You don't even get to call yourself officially a diplomat. It's foreign service officer. What a bummer. Um, but anyway, um, it, it, in talking with other foreign service officers, it's kind of interesting to, it's always interesting to compare how they did with the tests. And it's the rarest of the rare who actually passed through the first time every time. I took the written test and passed it all four times. I want to tell you, I passed it. Um, uh, four times, but uh, I flunked the oral the first and second time. The third time, I ended up not taking the oral because my life had changed and I had gotten a new job and I thought, forget the Foreign Service. Um, so I didn't even continue the process. And then the fourth time, I went all the way through. So, um, uh, you know, and all, you, all it takes is a Saturday, you know, to do either of the either of the two tests, so it's not a big deal, and you can just try and try again, if you'd like. Um, yeah, so what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll start with just a little overview of what the, what the Foreign Service is like, um, and then the rest, you know, you can ask me whatever you want, um, et cetera. So, um, so first, I guess, how do you get into the Foreign Service? Um, it's a series of tests, which I kind of prefer, let's say, over interviews, because let's face it, interviews are very subjective, and who knows what kind of impression you're going to make, whereas a series of tests, you know, you pass them or you don't. Um, the written test is, a, a, you know, an all-day test, and most of it's multiple choice. They have uh, um, questions about politics, economics, um, um, English, math, um, whereby I can tell you that I'm not a math whiz, and all of the questions on math I could basically answer by, I knew if some sort of theorem was being tested, but I couldn't remember the theorems from Math 101 when I was a freshman, but I could just figure it out by reasoning, so it's not that difficult, the math part. The English part is pretty difficult. They want people who can write well. Um, you're, you have to have pretty good you know, vocabulary and pretty good writing style, pretty good understanding of grammar and so forth and so on. And a general knowledge part. And it's all mixed in. Um, because they, they want people who have a general knowledge of a lot of things, can talk about a lot of things. Because in diplomacy, you're dealing with all kinds of stuff that you're not going to know much about. But if you know a little bit about a lot, you're more effective in a foreign setting. and You can go to cocktail parties and talk, talk about stuff you know a little bit about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the examples of a, of a uh, general knowledge question that I remember from way back then was, um, it was some question about a blues singer and their style of playing guitar. And if I remember correctly, the correct answer, and then there's multiple choice, which always helps people with superficial knowledge of a lot of things, right? Um, and I remember the correct answer was T-Bone Walker. Now, now I don't even remember who the heck T-Bone Walker was. At the time, I knew enough to, answer, to eliminate the rest and answer correctly. T-Bone Walker was the guy, I think, who played the guitar with the that little thing you put over your finger to make it slide more, you know? Um, and a key to that is they want you to know a lot about American history, American culture. The way that I prepared for the test back before the days when they had a million books you can, of course, buy and you know, do sample tests in and all that. That's what they have now. Um, I was before then. Um, I just, I read the New York Times 
um, every day for about two months before the test. Um, and I read a kind of freshman college level history book of the United States. So a general history of the United States. What a lot of people trip up on is they're interested in foreign countries and foreign policy, but you're being hired to represent the United States. So they want people who know about US history, understand US government and how it works, and so forth and so on. So you pass the written test if that happens. The next thing is an oral, a day of oral exams where you and four other people or so, four or five other people who pass the written test are together for a day. And there's four examiners from the Foreign Service who observe you. Um, and you do a lot of role plays. Uh, the Foreign Service loves role plays in training and hiring. Like, you pretend that you're the country team at an embassy. Um, the embassy of Erewhon, it used to be. Which, by the way, is backwards for nowhere. Erewhon. Get it? Um, so a ficti fictitious country, and you get this big packet of information about that country, economics, where it is, culture, history, polit political system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you read through that, and each person then also gets a project that the U.S. might be funding in this country. Um, and you know, it's what the project is, and how it helps U.S. interests to fund this project, and um, how much they're asking for, and all that. And then you all get together, and you're role-playing as if you're an embassy country team and the four examiners are watching you and you negotiate whose project is going to get funded. Um, and of course there's always less money available than the total of all the money that's been asked for so you have to decide. Um, and you know there they're testing your ability to quickly assimilate information about a country, to work in a team, to think more about U.S. interests than your own interest in whatever project, because it's actually just a project they asked you for, it's not your project. Um, you also, there's one thing, you just write an essay in 90 minutes, they give you four topics. Um, and at the time, some of this could be slightly changed, at the time uh, you had to write pros and cons of whatever topic you decided. I did nuclear energy, for example, the pros and cons of nuclear energy. Um, a couple of other things that kind of are similar to being in the Foreign Service that you kind of have to do. And then at the end, there's an interview with two of the, that's the interview part, with two of the four examiners individually. And you go into a room and they ask you all kinds of questions. And at the time I was uh, being hired, you got seven minutes to answer each question. And they also often would not ask you another question for seven minutes, just to test that you could fill the time without embarrassing silence, because you're also you know, interpersonal skills, getting, being in uncomfortable situations. Um, and just to give you an example, one thing I remember was, a question I got was, um, describe, um, Describe how the United States became a leader in the visual arts after World War II. You know, it's a very good general knowledge question, right? How much do you know about that? Can you think of Jackson Pollock and New York replacing Paris as kind of the scene of the international art scene and all that kind of stuff? Um, so it's very much kind of a general knowledge type thing. If you pass that, you then our, you have to pass a security check and then a health check to make sure that you're worldwide available, that you can go to places that might not have good medical uh, uh, treatment available immediately. And then if you get on that, you get on a waiting list and sooner or later you get called and you start training as foreign service officer. So that's how you get in. And with me what happened was the company that I was working for, this was between Calvin College teaching there and foreign service, basically went belly up. And at the time, you could be on the list, the waiting list, for up to a year and a half. And I'd just gotten on it. And um, at the time, I wrongly assumed that it was just a bureaucracy and there's no human beings. But human beings are a bureaucracy. That's the thing that you learn in the government. Bureaucracy is just human beings. So you can appeal to them as a human being. 
So I tried and it worked. I called him up and I said, look, I know that I'm in a certain spot on the waiting list and that's fine if you can't move me. However, the fact is right now, the company I'm working for is going belly up. I'm totally free. If you don't call me now, I have to look for another job and who knows what kind of job I'll get and what kind of job I'll have by the time you called me. And lo and behold, they called me the next day. So it worked. You, you can be on the wait, you can, it can last, it lasts generally a number of months after you've passed everything before they decide whether you're on the list. And then you can be on the list, it used to be, for up to a year and a half. And what can often happen actually is that, you know, people just kind of drift into it. Because you pass one, ah, let's see the another, pass the next. Then you pass the security exam and then you're on the waiting list forever and then they call you and you kind of, well, just go. That's what a lot of people do, actually. A lot of people don't plan on it. It just kind of happens if you, if you reach every spot. But yeah, there is an element of patience. And frankly, um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to you know, take the first test when you're a junior or whatever in college because by the time you're likely to get called, you'll be you'll graduate it, you know, as a senior. Um, also, I'm not sure that graduate school helps win or helps uh, pass the tests because it's a lot of general knowledge. It's not much special specialization. Um, and even kind of international relations studies in grad school, it's generally quite specialized, whereas they're asking obviously multiple choice questions on general interest topics in the international relations. So, you know, you can't really, it's like an IQ test in many ways. You know, it's so general. The general knowledge can be about anything. You're going to get questions wrong, you know. But if you're generally kind of knowledgeable, you know, you'll, you'll probably, probably do okay. Um, probably something that would give me real trouble right now is, man, my kids are young adults, and I realize I am so out of it in terms of popular culture. It's like I don't know anything. I'm much more ignorant than my parents were when, when, when they were my age. It's, it's amazing and I think it's a lot because of the internet and you know the balkanization of culture now because everybody can choose their own little universe, you know. Um, anyway, so, so, so here's, here's the job. There are, uh, there are five specializations within the Foreign Service. Um, interestingly enough, they are called cones. Um, they're not called specializations or specialties. Um, political, economic, public affairs, consular, consular, without a U, consular, consular, and um, administrative. So I was a political officer. I'll start with that. Um, the political cone is what people usually think of as diplomacy, and that's what I wanted to be. And man, was I glad when I got that cone, because it's quite different depending on the cone you get. So a political officer is basically doing the political side of diplomacy. And what that means is that you are getting to know the political scene in the country that you're in, and also making contacts among government officials, legislators, also legislators, of course, from opposition parties, and think tankers and those types. And you're, one, getting to know the personalities in the political scene in that country, what they're like, what they think of the United States, what they think of various other issues, what their influence is in the country. Are they more influential than you think? Are they less influential than you think? Who are the pl players behind them that no one's heard of, um, et cetera? And you report back to the State Department on those people. Biographical reporting is extremely important in the Foreign Service. And in fact, the CIA, as I can proudly tell you I have seen, um, the CIA steals State Department biographical reporting for the, the bios that they write. You know? And when we write it, we classify it confidential, which is you know, no one outside the US government who doesn't have a security clearance should see this, but they take what we classified confidential and they always classify it secret 
or top secret because of the CIA and therefore it has to be secret or top secret. Anyway, biographical reporting is uh, very important, but also reporting on the issues, you know, what's going on in the country, what are the issues, uh, what do they think of various issues that are important to the United States. Another aspect to political work is, is receiving demarches, French word démarche, receiving demarches from the State Department and telling you to go to the foreign ministry of the country that you're in and share the views of the United States on this particular issue. And then you do, you do that, and then you go back to the office, write up a report on what they said about that issue, what their government thinks about it, um, so that Washington knows, one, they've heard what we want them to do on this issue, and two, this is what they responded. Um, demarches are very often, um, for example, when the Saudi ambassador was murdered in Washington, D.C. The Saudi ambassador of the United States was murdered in Washington, D.C., and we suspected the Iranians had done it. Um, we got a demarche um, to go into the foreign ministry, um, and with me it was the de facto foreign ministry, right, because I was the, it was a mission to the EU at the time. So I went into their de facto foreign ministry um, and said, this is what we're going to do at, in order to punish Iran for committing this murder on our soil of an ambassador. Um, we're going to sanction them here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We'd like you to support our sanctions, and we'd like you also to do this, that, and the other thing to them, and we'd like you to argue for this, that, and the other thing in UN councils, for example, what should be done to Iran internationally. Um, and then they would say, okay, well, we'll take that under advisement and let you know, or they'd say, um, okay, well, good, this is what we're planning to do, and we'll help you here, and we won't help you there, or whatever, and you report back to Washington. Um, so that's one aspect of political work. The other aspect is, so you, you find out what's going on and you report back to Washington. Um, and also, a really great thing is that your reporting also includes analysis. State Department writing is fantastic writing, the, if it's done right. Um, a good State Department cable starts with a summary for, so that hopefully, Secretary of State maybe even, or people just below the Secretary of State will actually read it. They're way too busy to write the, read the whole cable. So there's a summary. It gives one sentence and not more than one sentence about each section of the cable, summarizing it. Um, and then generally say three paragraphs, let's say, on the substance of the cable, uh, of what you're reporting, and it's all facts. I said this, that person said that. This other person, however, said this. Nothing but, at, but facts, no analysis at all. And at the end, a comment. The comment is your view, you're the writer of the cable's view, on what this means. What, how should Washington interpret this and what does it mean for U.S. interests? And the summary, a well done summary, is three short sentences about the facts in the cable and one sentence at the end of the summary that summarizes the comment, what you really want the U.S. to do or what you really want the U.S. to know it means. So reporting back to Washington, the other side is advocating for U.S. interests in the country that you're in. Um, and that involves going in to, uh, you know, speak with politicians and so forth and making sure that you're talking about various things that the United States wants done or, or views that the United States has and making that clear to them, and depending on what kind of person they are, you know, emphasizing the areas that that person will probably use their influence to, to forward. Um, generally, at least in Europe, if they're conservatives, they're generally more um, favorable to the United States. If they're left-wingers, generally less favorable, but there's certain issues where, where they would agree with you, where the, the right-wingers would not agree with you. So, you know, you, you, you wisely um, forward U.S. interests in the country by knowing what people are likely to help the United States with, and then also public advocacy. Give speeches and so forth on topics of interest to the United States in the country you're in. So that's political work. Um, 
Economic work is basically the same, except it's about economics, right? So you deal with economic issues um, and uh, report on what's going on economically and further U.S. economic interests in the country. Um, you, you meet more business people, more business association types, and people who are working on economic policy, like the economics ministry type people, the trade ministry, more than political, which deals with the foreign ministry and stuff like that. Um, public affairs uh, is, um, is two things. One, you are the person who deals with the press in the country. Um, the embassy spokesperson is almost always a public affairs officer. Um, you write the press releases that quote the ambassador saying something that he never said, but rather that you said he said this, and then he looks at it and says, yeah, put this out, we'll put this out as the message, and it's generally quoting the ambassador, but basically you wrote the press release because you know this is what the United States would say about this, um, and, and, and you craft the embassy's public message to the people of the country through the press. Um, that's one side. The other side is cultural affairs. Personally, I think cultural affairs is interesting, but I think it's one thing that actually could be cut. Um, and I say this, I was once a public affairs, I had a job as a public affairs officer in Mexico once, so I actually did this for three years. I was the press spokesman at the consulate in Monterey and then did cultural affairs too. Cultural affairs is kind of generally educational exchanges, which you don't necessarily need an, an officer at the embassy to do, like the Fulbright program, you know, for study abroad and so forth. Important, but not necessarily needed to be done at the embassy. Um, and other things that further cultural exchange, like you sponsor United States speakers who come to the country to talk about some aspect of life in the United States. Um, you sponsor art exhibits, uh, concerts, so forth and so on. So that's public affairs. Fourth is consular. Everybody serves, almost everybody serves, even if they're not in the consular cone, their first tour as a consular officer. Consular basically means deciding whether or not to issue visas to visa applicants from the country that you're in. Um, on the one side, and then American Citizen Services on the other side. You issue passports to Americans who've lost their passport or Americans who live in that country who need a replacement passport. You issue co consular reports of birth abroad. If you're born to two American citizens outside the United States, you still are born a U.S. citizen, but you need the birth certificate won't say that because it's not a U.S. birth certificate, so you, they have to go to the consulate and you write them a consular report of birth abroad, which is a confirmation that they were born a U.S. citizen, and also you visit U.S. prisoners. Um, so you visit prisons in the country to make sure that the prisoners are being treated okay, or things like that. Um, I'll tell you a few stories about that in a minute, but you have a question. Uh, just quickly, um, so I, I had to go to Chicago about a week ago to get an application so I could study abroad long-term in a foreign country. Um, why can't you just like mail in or um, send in your paper, why they want you there physically in person for a lot of that type of thing. So what consulate were you at? I was at for Spain. Say it again? For Spain. Okay, so Spain, they wanted you to come into the consulate personally. Right, and talk with them. Yeah. Um, well, you know, more and more they are doing mail, mail order applications, um, kind of straightforward visa applications. Um, but, you know, each country is different and each individual case is different. Um, generally, for example, in developing countries, people have to come in to interview for a visa to the United States. Why? Because the main objective of U.S. visa uh, law and regulation is to ensure that in order to get a visa, you, the applicant, show that you do not intend to misuse that visa in order to stay in the United States forever once you're in and become an illegal immigrant. You know, many, many, if not still most, actually, of the 
illegal immigrants in the United States did not cross the border over Mexico. They got a non-immigrant visa at some consulate or embassy, and then they just stayed in the United States. Um, and so since developing countries, people are more likely to want to go to the United States and you know, seek their fortune, improve their lives, they generally have to come into the consulate or the consular section of the embassy to be interviewed for the visa. And it's very much kind of like factory work. I mean, there are so many visa applicants. Um, you, you know, you're spending 30 seconds to 90 seconds interviewing each applicant. You quickly look at their application, their supporting materials, you ask them a couple of key questions, and then you make the decision. And this is the, the, the irony of consular work. By the way, do interrupt me in this particular section because I want you to be able to ask before you forget stuff if you have questions. Consular work, you know, I did it my first two years, which was Frankfurt, and then I did it my second year in Costa Rica, my second post. So I did three years of consular work out of my 20 years. Um, and um, it's not my thing, but man, what interesting situations you get in. And also, consular work, to me, actually is the most important work of the Foreign Service. I was political. I'm glad I was, because that's what interests me. I loved it. But consular work, the ironic thing is, first tour junior officers on the visa line are making decisions every day that are more important than the, whatever decision the ambassador likely made that day. Why? Because it's real people. It affects the lives of real people. So to get a visa, you're supposed to show the consular officer that um, you have no reason to stay in the United States illegally. You just want to go as a tourist and come back. Um, you generally show that by showing strong ties to the country you live in. That will compel your return. You're married. You've got a job. You know, you've got the economic um, means to do the trip you're planning. It's realistic. All that kind of stuff. So here's an example of the importance of the decision. I was in Frankfurt, and uh, um, there's no U.S. embassy in Tehran, of course because we don't have any diplomatic relations with Iran. There's tons and tons and tons of Iranians in Germany. And so 8% of our applicants, visa applicants in Frankfurt, were Iranians. Um, and generally, they would fly from Iran, visit relatives in Germany, and apply for a visa while they're there to the US. So I had this little woman. I just remember she was like 4 foot 10. You know, and she had the, the black on and everything. Um, and, you know, the wrinkles in the face is in the face like only people from developing countries, you know what I mean, can have just these deep, deep wrinkles in her face. And, um, and she was, and her son who lived in Frankfurt was translating for her. So she spoke Farsi, he translated into German. I answered in German, the son translated back into Farsi. So. She lived in Tehran. I don't know anything about Iran and her situation there. I can't judge it. I'm in Frankfurt. She was a widow. She's got no husband to go back to. Um, she's 85. She's got no job to go back to in Iran. Um, she's got family in Frankfurt, and her reason for wanting to go to the U.S. was to visit her son in New York, who she hadn't seen in 20 years before she dies. She wanted to see her son the last time before she died. Well, she's got no ties that she can show me to her home country. Um, she's got no residence permit for Germany, so she can't stay in Germany. She's going to visit a son um, who probably actually originally entered the United States on a non-immigrant visa and never left. It's probably how he ended up in New York. So she had no ties that she could show me, so the law compelled me to say no. So I said no, and she was, hold, she, she, she was holding on to the outside of the window, and there's a little thing they could slip their documents to, through, and she's trying to touch me, to you know, plea with me by touching me. Please, please let me go. I want to see my son before I die. And her son, the one in, who lived in Frankfurt, is literally 
pulling her away from the window. And uh, I'm kind of standing behind the window, shaking my head saying no. And there's this waiting room filled with people from all over the world, all looking at me like I'm a horrible villain who won't let this lady visit her son before she dies that she hasn't seen in 20 years. Now, this is an important decision. It's a really, really important decision. And I felt horrible about the fact that I said no. Go ahead. Sorry, quick question, but you may, I thought about this. This is a practical thing. So she obviously had to give you the address of where her son lived in New York, right? Uh, where her, yes. Mm -hmm. And you assume that he's illegal. Why don't you just immediately pass it on to ICE and be like, here's where this guy is, and arrest him? Because the information sharing, and this was, of course, pre-9-11, but even post-9-11, the information sharing between various departments of the government is minimal and inadequate, and the resources are minimal and inadequate. And I'm telling you, some guy who's now been in the U.S. 20 years, probably now has a family, who originally entered on a non-immigrant visa and just stayed, no one's going to worry about that. There's no time and money to worry about that. I guess the follow-up is I just don't understand how we got to so a like, minimum number now is probably 10 million illegals, but it's probably higher than that, right? So why does it just keep building up? Why is there no... Why, why doesn't ICE do anything about it, I guess? Like the practical level, the bureaucracy, why doesn't that happen? Regardless of the policy. Yeah, yeah I mean, I guess I think, I think the most realistic thing is just simply that you know, so many people want to get into the United States that the demand and the resourcefulness that people are going to use to get into the United States are so much greater than the resources and the time of the immigration enforcement agencies of the United States government. And it's been so long and so continuous for decades and decades and decades that this was a situation that was almost inevitable in a certain sense. I guess I'd say that. By the way, of course, it's irrelevant to whether I would give her a visa, whether her son is an illegal immigrant. Right, no, sorry, it's just an aside. And I want to tell you, she came in the next day. I talked to my wife that night about it. She said there was a rule applicants could come in twice. She said if she comes in the next day, just give her the visa. And I did. I gave her the visa the second day. And I probably shouldn't have. She probably was not. I mean, the point is not whether they want to be an illegal immigrant, but whether they can show you that there's no reason for them to be one. That's the real law that you as the consular officer have to decide on. Um, can they show you that they've got no reason to stay in the United States? She couldn't, you know, but I gave her the visa anyway. And under law, the consular officer decides. So these are very important issues. You know, the, after the first day, it could be that I kept this poor Iranian woman from seeing her son and grandkids, all that stuff. After the second day, it could very well have been that I let this woman in who fully intended to stay forever in the United States. Then again, I mean, I don't want to sound non-conservative here, but she was 85, for goodness sake. You know, she, forever in the United States for her was not going to be very long because she was 85. That is not an excuse for giving her the visa. Anyway, that's an example. American Citizen Services, consular, uh, if an American dies in a country, then it's your, uh, it's your duty to notify the next of kin in the United States if they don't know already. Um, uh, and I, and every consular officer makes death calls. It's amazing. I mean, Americans are everywhere in, 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 in the world, and they die, you know. And, uh, you know, I've had to call up parents and tell them that their son, who was on a trip to Germany, you know, had an accident and died. Um, or visiting American prisoners in the country you're in. Yes? So then what would happen if you were in a country like Iran that you just said earlier didn't have diplomatic relations with the U.S.? Yeah, um, if you're in a, a country with no diplomatic relations, then you know Sweden or Switzerland or whatever, I think in Iran, it's Switzerland, I think, handles, has a U.S. interest section that handles U.S. interests for us. But there is no diplomatic presence at all in Iran. 
Are there so, a lot of countries like that? This no, Iran, North Korea, Cuba has long had a U.S. interest section that in reality was a U.S. embassy, and then Obama restored relations with Cuba and it became an embassy. So really, Iran, North Korea, there's some others, but those are the only ones that come to mind. So, um, uh, yes? Uh, oh, so were you, did you, sorry, did you have much more to, I thought we were being the questions, but I might have jumped the gun on that. Let me tell you one, tell one more thing and then, then a question. I'm trying to think of my most emblematic prisoner story. Oh, <coughs> here's an example of, of the amazingly interesting situations you'll get into in the Foreign Service. In Hamburg, at the consulate, I was the political economic officer. But the consular administrative officer, we combined because it was a small post, um, left early because of something that happened. So for like four months, I was the political economic consular administrative officer. And during that time, an American was arrested. It was the, he was the head of a United States Nazi party headquartered in Nebraska, where he was from. He had gone to Denmark at the invitation of a <laughs> radical right group in Denmark to give a speech. The Danes told the Germans that he was going to be there. He had committed a crime in Germany. He had disseminated Nazi propaganda over the internet, which was a crime in Germany, but not a crime in the United States. And he'd done it while physically present in the United States. But the Germans believed, since he distributed internet Nazi propaganda, if he comes to Germany, he's committed a crime and we're going to arrest him. So the Danes told the Germans, and they, they then arrested, the Danes arrested the guy and extradited him to Germany and put him in prison, in a Hamburg prison. And I visited him, and uh, he was telling me correctly that he was a political prisoner in Germany and that he was a U.S. citizen and the U.S. government better help him out. And he was right. He had committed no crime in the United States. What he'd done, he'd done while he was in the United States. Um, he was basically illegally arrested by the Danes who illegally gave, turned him over to the Germans um, and they had him in prison. Um, so I reported back to the State Department about what was happening and what he was saying and basically the State Department monitored the case and didn't do anything for him and I think after four or five years, you know, he was, he was let out of prison. I don't know where he is now. But these are such interesting things that actually happen in the Foreign Service. One more thing, uh, somebody came up to help with consular admin from another post in Germany, from maybe the embassy, and she visited him. And the first thing he asked was, so where's your Jewish colleague? At the time, my hair was darker than it is now. I had a dark beard. I looked Jewish. Um, he thought I was Jewish. Interestingly enough, he never mentioned that to my face, but the first thing he said to the, my colleague was, where's your Jewish colleague? I was going to ask, legally, how does that work? So like another country can arrest you for a crime that you committed not on their soil, but like it's not, it's, it's, do you kind of like, you kind of get what I'm trying to get at here? Like how, so I like, um, I could do something in the United States, another country. So like, let's say I smoked a drug in the United States. I went to a country where smoking that drug was illegal, but I did something in my past. And so that country can arrest me for that. Well, Germany really didn't have a right, probably, to arrest this man, especially since he was in Denmark and arrested by the Danes for the Germans, at the request of the Germans. And if he'd been a Democrat or, or a Republican, I'm sure the United States would have gone to the highest level and done everything they can to say, let this guy out of prison. But since he was a Nazi, the fact is the United States government, as far as I know, didn't do anything to help him because we didn't want to help a Nazi, so which again shows you that real life is different than the written law. So then would he, if he wanted to have recourse, he would have to like sue the United States government? Say again? So if he wanted recourse for that, he would have to sue the US government, or how would he do that? Well, um, you know, the consular officer is the US government. His job is to visit 
people in prison in the country <coughs> and do what they can to see that that person is being treated well. If the person was arrested according to the laws of the country they're in, there's really nothing we can do. If the person was arrested illegally, well, that would actually be illegally according to the laws of that country, which are not the US law. So then we would handle it through diplomatic channels, talk to the government about releasing this person. The biggest problem in this area of work about kind of legality and international issues is child custody. That's the big issue. You have a binational couple. One of them is American, the other one is from some other country originally. They live in the United States, they get divorced. Um, the, the person not from the United States takes the kids, goes back to their home country, and stays in their home country with the kids. Meanwhile, maybe the American parent has been given custody by a U.S. court. Well, what are you going to do? So then the foreign diplomatic office would have to try to negotiate with the country of which the children are now in? What you do is you, try to, you, try, you go through diplomatic channels and try to get um, the government to enforce the U.S. custody order by a U.S. court and bring the children back to the custody of the American parent in the United States. But there are very few countries that are going to willingly do that. Above all, I can tell you again from experience, Germany. A German and an American are married. They get divorced. The American in the United States gets the custody of the kids. The German takes the kids to Germany. The Germans basically always let the German citizen remain in Germany with the kids. But these are huge emotional issues, as you can imagine. So that's consular work. The final thing is administrative work. Um, you know, interestingly enough, you know, masters in business administration, right? The, the, the kind of the area, I guess, that generally leads to the most money and prestige outside of the Foreign Service is generally the area that's the least desired in the Foreign Service because politically interested types are ones that join the Foreign Service generally. And you know, administrative work is administering the embassy, you know, making sure there's enough housing for the, for the officers, the budget function, um, security function is also under administrative, you know, making sure that the security arrangements are adequate for the embassy and for embassy workers and so forth. So those are the, the five cones, the five specialties. Um, as I said, uh, when I talked to the Foreign Service officer before, the, which the, the talk that kind of made me decide I was going to try to get to the Foreign Service, and he told me about the interesting Foreign Service career. Um, I thought this is the job I want, and I can actually tell you that I was not disappointed. It's a great job, fascinating job. The best part and the worst part is moving around overseas. Uh, it's the best part because it's amazing and fascinating to live in different countries, to get to know people from different countries, different languages, different perspectives. Fascinating. Um, if you are religious, you get a special in in that, I find, compared to secular Foreign Service officers, because you go to church, you know, and you get to know a lot of average, everyday people from the country. Um, but it's also the worst because it's a very rootless life. It can be quite stressful. You're moving every two or three years. Um, it's hard on kids, it can be hard on marriages. So that's why we left after 20 years, because after 20 years you can get a pension. And my wife and I decided we were going to leave because our kids at the time, six years ago, were just young enough still to set down roots in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and actually be from somewhere before they became adults and left the home. But there's a huge benefit again. 20 years and, and you get a pension for the rest of your life? Fantastic. So consider the Foreign Service. If you have any questions, um, you can have my email, and uh, I'd be glad to answer any further questions you have.